I have always had empathy and sought to understand the black experience more. However, I have never been pulled over by the police. And every interaction I've had with the police, as soon as I've opened my mouth, their energy towards me has changed because in their eyes, I don't sound American. Therefore, I am not one of those people. It's the On Stage Podcast with Chris Rubbert. Emma G is here. Love it. Yes. Hello. She's an award-winning musician, author, youth empowerment coach, and she's also had a lifelong battle with a rare neurological condition called hydrocephalus, which she's going to explain a little later. Um, yeah. And her music is a unique style that marries the styles of pop, soulful ballads and a gritty rock edge beautiful stuff and i love I, the guitars in the back and i love the sign that you have there i mean it's my studio this is where i go to re refill my cup and ensure that my clients are always feeling seen our life is what our, our thoughts, thoughts make it oh wow and i actually listen to a lot of her music can you turn up your volume a little bit so I can hear you. <laughs> Is that better? Yeah. Yeah, cool. So, and an award-winning musician. So we like to get into that. Can you give us a little bit of a backstory of who you are? Oh, gosh. Um, okay. Well, my name is Emma G. Um, I hail from New Zealand, even though my mother is from Erie, Pennsylvania. My father was from Fiji. My mother's father was from Iran, and my mother's mother is from Iowa by way of Norway. So I, you know, had a very unique upbringing uh, that sort of cross culminated a, a, a number of different cultures, um, approaches to life, etc. But in addition to that, I also, you know, was born with a neurological condition called hydrocephalus, which means while everybody's brains floats in water, or otherwise known as cerebral spinal fluid, my brain, uh, well, everybody's, yeah, everybody's brain's floats in water. For most people, that water changes by between 200 and 400 milliliters a day. Um, the water will enter into your head and then drain it down your spinal column. But for me, I have a cyst or a pillow of water in the middle of my cranium, which blocks off the exit way. So water can get into my, into my skull, but it has no way of exiting. So at the age of um, four months, I had my first brain surgery when a tube, otherwise known as a shunt, was inserted into my head, draining down my spinal column, um, sorry, draining down my neck into my peritoneal cavity. So... Yeah, um, I've had 10 brain surgeries in total, 24 surgeries altogether, including on my peritoneal cavity, etc. And I was very lucky in that I found at a very early age that music and songwriting were instrumental, pun intended, um, to not just help me express myself and connect with my own what methods of um, working through the trauma, but also by leaning into songwriting, I found that I was able to connect and communicate more effectively with others about my thinking, my thoughts, my struggles, my pain points. And because it's, you know, songwriting and music go hand in hand, music actually affects the brain in a way that can help stimulate brain regrowth and redevelopment, um, help with memory issues, which have which came about as a result of brain surgery and um, brain damage. Um, it helped me with cognitive function. It helped me with learning more effectively. Like there's so many benefits to, to music and songwriting together that I, yeah, have been sort of practicing since I was five. And to this day through, here's my cat now, <laughs> to this day now I'm able to, um, you know, utilize music to connect with my, my myself, my my community, my partner, my friends, and more importantly, my audience, as I help them to, you know, be vulnerable with me. Um, what was that like for you, especially the brain surgeries? What was your fear? What was that going to your head? 
you have no idea anytime you go into a into surgery about what's going to happen. And because hydrocephalus is and the brain are two areas that are constantly being learned about, like we have no, we, we just, we have no idea about the brain. We, we think we do. There is, there is new science coming out every day about new advancements and new learnings and new discoveries. For me, my specific experience is kind of stifled because when pressure builds up in your head, your memory is affected. So I literally cannot remember big chunks of my childhood, let alone big chunks of being in a hospital. However, what I will say is that I, for years, up until my late 20s, would have recurring dreams about being in hospital, banging my head against the wall, hoping to God that I would die because the pressure was building up so significantly in my skull that I just, it was painful, you know, and so, but I can't remember it only, you know, I can only rely on this dream as kind of what it was like for me. Um, so like, it wasn't that I was even fearful of death. It was, I need a way out of this painful situation. You know what I mean? For my mother, um, you know, she was, she raised me by herself and I, um, you know, it was just her and me basically. So her experiences, I, I can't even begin to speak on, but, you know, from what I understand, every minute <laughs> was, was, you know, traumatic for her um, in terms of will my daughter die today type thing. Um, or will she be a vegetable? Will she be able to learn how to spell again? Will she wake up, um, you know, not knowing how to speak, not knowing how to, will she recognize me? You know, so even to this day, I still have directional memory issues, um, but that's about it. That must have been um, quite a situation for your parents to go through that, and all these things going through the parents' brain, like what you said, um, is my daughter going to die today or how long does she have? Or and, it's, it's interesting because, you know, to your point, again, you know, everybody's brains and everybody's experiences with their brains are different. You know, I'm simply, my experience has been that pressure buildup from fluid buildup in my head has created, um, you know, creative pressure on my brain, which meant that I suffered some brain damage. Okay? So again, that's one of the reasons why music has been so important in my brain redevelopment and brain function because music stimulates the right-hand side of the brain, the, uh, sorry, left-hand side of the brain, which is in charge of the, the creativity function. Um, and then, I think I've got that right. Um, and then with, with the songwriting aspect, which is more your data and analytical side of yourself, um, you know, that, that stimulates the other side of the brain. So it's able to, by, by, by stimulating both sides of the brain at the same time, you're actually um, then stimulating the... Uh, like there's about 200 nerve fibers at the base of your skull. Um, I think the collective term is the nucleus accumbens. And so when those are fired up, when that's when those 200 micro brain fibers are fired up at the same time because you're stimulating both sides of the brain, that's what helps to redevelop um, brain function. And you know, you, you're right. People have no idea how. Um, you know, the struggle that you've gone through, but to that same end, because people have no idea, I think their perspectives on how to live a fulfilling life is also dramatically different. Like I have seen death. I have walked that path. I have, you know, been near death 
countless times. Therefore, I just don't live my life the same way that the average person might because I recognize very clearly how vulnerable we all are and how blessed I am by God's grace to be able to wake up every day and live a full, whole, satisfying existence. Different sorts of hydrocephalus out there? Yes, I think. I it's, And it's funny because I, I live in Washington, D.C., and just up the road in Rockville is the Hydrocephalus Awareness Association of America. So <laughs> I really should be more in contact with them. But um, they are, from my knowledge, from the last conversation I had with them, they are discovering that everybody wears hydrocephalus differently. In fact, most, uh, like, I think there's about a million cases of hydrocephalus across the states. And many of those cases are actually um, in the older generation and have been, by and large, misdiagnosed as dementia. So, yes, I, I believe, <laughs> you know, they're their cases are not necessarily as life-threatening as mine has been but who knows we're still learning about it every day but that's uh, incredible 10 brain surgeries like what are they trying to do you mind me asking with these surgeries Relief that's a great question pressure? yeah so for you for example you your brain floats in the cerebral spinal fluid that water goes into your head drains down your spinal column because of my cyst, the, the spinal column exit way is completely shut off. So I have a tube called a shunt go from my brain to my peritoneal cavity to drain out the water. However, during times of massive hormonal change, particularly, um, lumps can form in the shunt. So a blockage can occur. And then, of course, the water has no way to get out. So pressure starts to build up build up, build up, I get very bad headaches, start vomiting, fall unconscious, and, pop, you know, and, and my, my life ends. Um, so with every surgery, they either go into my head or into my stomach or my, my peritoneal cavity to find where the blockage is and get rid, either get rid of the blockage or replace the entire shunt in its entirety. Do you feel that the 10th surgery is the last one for you? I pray. <laughs> we don't know. You know, it could, uh, issues could arise during menopause, but we don't know. Does it affect your coordination? Do your hands shake? No. Vision no. impairment? No? Nope. Nope. That's amazing. Hey, everyone, we have blessed. a miracle sitting right here. <laughs> Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah, no, I'm, I'm very blessed. I'm very, um, you know, not a day goes by that I don't recognize how, how high the mountains have been that I've had to climb. But again, I haven't been alone when I've climbed them, you know, there's been, I, yeah, not a day goes by. I just, I recognize that I am blessed. Wow, God is good. We'd like to talk to you about the um, being in the author part of you. And there's a book which you are right, you have written called um, Here It Is Here. You're connecting <laughs> with your teenager. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Everyone, reconnecting yes. with your teenager is for sale 997 at Amazon. And the link will be down below and if you want to buy a copies also of kindles 2.99 yes so go ahead so yeah this this basically what happened was you know i have been dealing with trauma my entire life okay i started with brain surgery but as we all know being a young person um in the world no matter what generation you are comes with its difficulties you know we've all been young once 
and we've all experienced some level of trauma as a result of being young. So um, for me, not only was I contending with the battle of neurological surgery, but I was also contending with being a young woman of color in New Zealand. Now, I should preface being a woman of color in New Zealand is not nearly as potentially um, traumatic as being a person of color in the States. However, um, you know, my own story isn't necessarily rooted in the color struggle. It's more rooted in the female struggle. So for me, I had a lot of um, negative experiences and interactions with people um, as a young woman, as a teenager. Um, and then consequentially, I fell in with a not great crowd and uh, was exposed to some really horrific things. So, you know, even at the age of 19, my ex-boyfriend killed himself. Um, my surrogate brother passed away from a medical complication. My surrogate father um, passed away from alcohol abuse. My dog died. I was dumped. Like it was a, it was a really horrible year. And that was kind of when I decided like, well, shoot, I've, you know, been blessed to walk this earth despite the uh, trials and tribulations. And I, I distinctly remember like on my 15th, when, when I was 15, that I, um, I remember feeling in my soul, maybe it was God talking to me, I don't know, but, you know, feeling the sense of I'm here for a reason, I'm here for a purpose. So when I was 19 and this horrible year happened, um, I decided to step into that purpose a little more and um, try to do all I could to prevent anything, any other young person that I met to feeling so traumatized and so overwhelmed, so whatever, that they felt they had no other option than to end their life. So I, I dove into teaching. I, I started my own practice as a vocal instructor privately that evolved into me teaching a, a choir, running adult education classes, that then evolved into me working at a university in New Zealand, that then evolved into me working for the YMCA. And as, as I've sort of continued to work and teach and pour into other people, I've also continued to write my own music and use that as a, as a methodology to, you know, reach the masses. But it wasn't until I moved to the States in 2015 that I really wanted to dive more significantly into youth work and youth development. And 2019, I established Youth Empowerment through songwriting, coaching, where I partner my love of music and my, my superpowers in songwriting uh, with my, you know, award-winning youth work experience. So um, Youth Empowerment through songwriting is literally helping mentor, coach, guide, um, counsel young people through turning their trauma, their overwhelm, their anxiety into opportunities for growth and opportunities for them to thrive and, you know, become happy, healthy humans, figure out ways to communicate with their parents and communities more effectively. This book is a parent's guide to helping use my tools and techniques into reconnecting with their child themselves because sometimes you know obviously we all want to connect with our children ourselves and sometimes we need help i'm there for the help if the book doesn't help if the if, if your own you know <laughs> connection with your child is is maybe so far um too difficult to to navigate yourself you know i i'm good at my job i i'm you know my one of my mentors calls me the teenage whisperer um and i'm, I'm very um experienced in speaking teenager and also in speaking adult and being able to help them 
to come out of their overwhelm feeling more, um, well, a, a stronger sense of self and feeling healthier and, you know, learning how to write their theme song for their life in a way that helps them to wake up every day feeling empowered, seen, validated, loved, etc. cetera. Um, this book was literally just like a, I don't want to cut people off from being able to do the work with their teenagers themselves because the first port of call, every, every successful child is one carrying animals away. That first port of call should be the parent. If the parents, if the breakdown in communication is so significant between parent and teenager, then that's when I come in. But first and foremost, that relationship should happen between the parent and child. What is your family like towards you? How do they treat you? Do they treat you like, well, she could be gone tomorrow? Or does do they, do they just treat you the same way as you've always been? Because life is very precious. For your music, I can imagine you using every step of your emotion and passion in every lyric and every every part of music that you write flows from this life stream, this, this, um, this past experience. Your first question, do my parents or my family um, treat me differently? My father wasn't around when I was growing up. My father lived my entire life in Fiji with his wife and other, you know, my brothers and sisters, my five half brothers and sisters. Um, but my father, every time I visited him, would, uh, you know, make sure to connect me through music. So that was our sort of love language with each other, which was great. Um, when it came to my mother and how she treated me, you know, she was, she, yeah, she, she had me young um, and she poured everything into ensuring that I succeeded and thrived in life, you know, that happened to be mostly through music and that's you know a lot of why I, I am like i am today but the rest of my family i don't think they really think about it you know i was born with hydrotephalus so they've only known me as that but i've never been i've always been kind of like the outlier in my family um in terms of like I'm not the normal kid. <laughs> so it wasn't, but I don't think people treated me differently because of my hydrocephalus. I just think that it was, I don't know. I um, lived a different world than they did. And I still live a different world than they do. Um, but I think that's probably one of the reasons why I poured myself so significantly into music because I wanted to connect with, somebody whether it was my family whether it was my friends whether it was this you know the stranger down the street um music has always been my voice it's been my love language and so look around specifically i think i mean i i, I distinctly remember being inspired by another new zealand musician by the name of Ridge morrison who had a song has a song called Burning Rain, which is all about environmental awareness. For me, being a young, precocious 10-year-old, um, hearing that my, and, and having the knowledge of like living out between New Zealand, a first world country, and Fiji, a third world country, my acknowledgement of different ways of life and living and the environment were different to a lot of my peers. So I think, you know, that in combination with Midge Morrison's song was where that song came from. Um, and I think that's probably, that song was a testament to how empathetic I was from a very young age. Um, because as much as I didn't grow up with acid rain in my world, I understood how horrific that reality could be and I wanted to do all I could to ensure that we don't live, that I don't grow up in a world that 
manifests more environmental and ecological um, disobedience. But, you know, that, that, that was from like a, a perspective, uh, that was from a more holistic perspective as opposed to other songs of mine, which were more introspective. You have the um, one I am, and mm -hmm. then the song still singing, obviously. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So what's I am about? I am is my affirmation plus song. Um, you know, the two most powerful words in the English language, it has been argued, are the words I am. Now, to take that back to the Bible, if you are a religious person, um, there, and I, I, I'm no, <laughs> I'm no expert on that at all, but I um, am aware that uh, there are a number of times that um, God is referred to in the with the words I am and I personally I, I relate that to you know if we are all made in God's image then of course anything that you say following the words I am and not just reflection of yourself but also a reflection of God of source of the universe of the force whatever languaging you want to use to attribute to your spiritual practice um but for me the words I am you know historically again being a woman of color being somebody who has experienced brain trauma, neurological, you know, surgery, and other uh, sources of trauma. Um, I wanted to write my own anthem of healing and resilience and overcoming, specifically because for a long time, I didn't just find myself being told that I was X, Y, and Z label, but also I would start to translate that into my own self-labeling. Um, and that's an unfortunate, I think, consequence of living in, in a very linear society that we do, you know, where we're told to tick one box, we're told to ascribe to one gender, one ethnicity, one genre, one whatever. Um, and I think it's really important that we recognize that I'm not just a New Zealander, I'm also Fijian, I'm also American, I'm also Norwegian, I'm also Persian, I'm not just a musician, I'm also a youth mentor, I'm also a public speaker, I'm also, you know, an author, I'm not just, I'm not just, I'm not just, and that's not just me speaking, that's everybody. We don't just fit into one box. And I think it's really important that we recognize that we are all warriors and survivors and healers and fighters and overcomers and so on and so forth. So that song was my my sort of my meditation, my prayer, my anthem of self-love. And still singing as a kind of as a kind of lead on to that of like, you know, the world specifically over the last two and a half years has been really traumatic for many of us, but we can either lean into the fear or we can lean into the resilience and hope and strength that can come from that trauma. And I, being somebody of color who's learning about not just, you know, how to overcome the, the pandemic, but also how to exist in a, in a world where colorism is a thing um, and where my friends are multi-ethnic, multi-religious, multi-faceted. Um, I wanted to figure out a way for me to understand myself when it comes to continue finding the strength to continue because many people especially after the the murder of george floyd found themselves um swimming in an ocean of anger and and pain and suffering and that's totally fair and totally important and totally part of the process my personal response was, okay, 
how can I use my voice to grow from this and to continue in a way that serves me and the world, not just serves my pain. That whole George Floyd issue back in the pandemic, that really was a racial issue. I mean, I read the whole story and what happened, and I'm like, and I'm glad that the officer involved went to prison for that because murder is murder, regardless what color your skin is. So yeah. we're all the same. Yeah. And for a woman of color yourself, I guess issues like this obviously have more of an impact on you. You know anything about critical race theory, which is still going on. Um, I've done a lot of research on this. and I, I just think, you know what? God made us all. We're all brothers and sisters. And, and that um, you're not black, you're not white. You're just a person who mm -hmm. has feelings and emotion. Mm -hmm. And it's terrible what um, the history of slavery, and we don't want that to be repeated. But there, you still have like, Ku Klux Klan's out there, and it's ridiculous. I get, I'm really upset about that. I'm really mad about that. I treat yeah. everyone like a brother. When I'm at my church, we were at a barbecue. The black guy had this, um, should I say black guy? Is that wrong to say? Should I just He's say a black guy. That's fine. man of color? Okay. Um, he walked towards me with a hamburger, and I said, hey, brother. And he goes, why are you calling me brother? And I said, because you are. And I told him, said, well, because he said another man of color um, he's called him brother, and he said, I'm not your brother. I'm not your brother. <laughs> Don't you understand what the word brother means? So I, I find it ridiculous, but... Um, <laughs> yeah. I, I think it's, it's funny because, you know, languaging... Uh, there, there, that's, you've raised a number of points, and I, I want to I wanna touch on each of them. First of all, the term brother changes from different person to different person um, and again I didn't grow up in this country so I'm still learning about this all the time um, now let me let me sit back calling a person a man of color a person of color um, black person whatever it depends on your audience some people will find offense to it some people won't some people and I, that, that's been something that I've been sort of learning about my entire time living here as well. Um, me, personally, if if you say a black person, you should also be saying a white person. What I find often happens in conversations is people will say, oh, you know, the guy down the street um, will da 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 go on and, you know, go into the story. And it's assumed automatically that the person that they're talking about is a, is a white person. Yet, when it comes to, you know, talking about the black guy down the street, the Asian person down the street, I think for me, it's important that we recognize that picking on specific races or ethnicities in terms of your description, that in and of itself can be viewed as racist rhetoric. Right. So, and whether or not the languaging you um, use to describe that as a person of color or, or a black person or whatever, that again, that depends on your audience. Um, I tend to interchangeably use person of color, black American, African American. But again, when you say African American, that's assuming that the person came from Africa and came here willingly. If you were born in this country and you're, you know, a black person, the feedback I've gotten has been they're black, they're black, they're black American, you know, they're not African American because they have no lineage or no, no ties to Africa. And that's because their entire family history has been erased. They've been given a, a, a white man's name and they've been forced into this identity that they've never been able to fit into particularly well. You know what I mean? So that, that anyways, I'm, I'm going to put that, that to bed. When it comes to my own experiences as a person of color in this country, I'm still learning significantly every day because the circles that I move in are varied. My partner is black. We live together. 
Um, I, you know, we celebrate each other's culture. He is finding it very interesting learning about my New Zealand, Norwegian, Persian, American, Fijian upbringing, um, as much as I'm finding it interesting learning about his experience as a, as a Black man in America. I have always had empathy and sought to understand the Black experience more. However, I have never been pulled over by the police. And every interaction I've had with the police, as soon as I've opened my mouth, their energy towards me has changed because in their eyes, I don't sound American. Therefore, I am not one of those people that needs to be worried about. Therefore, because I sound British or Kiwi, um, I must be educated. Therefore, I should be treated a certain type of way. So it's like, and you're rolling your eyes and I'm thinking, yeah, and, and it makes me angry because I'm like, why the heck would your initial energy towards me be some type of way until I open my mouth and now you're, you know, like treat, treat us all the same, whether you're white, black, Latino, Asian, Fijian, whatever. We're all human beings. And, and that is a beautiful thing. Diversity is a superpower. Um, I, I, I wish that we, I wish that we could understand that more. The only way to overcome that, however, is to do the work. You know, yes, the Ku Klux Klan still, still exist. Yes, I've had MAGA people come to my shows. But instead of shying away from those conversations, I want to offer them a light and an opportunity through my music to recognize the potential errors in their ways. You know, if I can have a conversation with somebody who believes that I am less than them and they can start to recognize that there is education here and that there is humanity here and there is, you know, a person in front of them as opposed to 0.6 of a person, then that can be a really beautiful thing. They don't know what they don't know. And if, they're not, if, if I don't allow them the opportunity to know, how, about, how can I expect them to learn. In fact, there's another fantastic musician here in the DC metropolitan area by the name of Daryl Davis, who does the same work. In fact, he had a TED talk come out uh, a few years back where he's a black American fellow musician, phenomenal human being who his work is in visiting KKK members and helping them to see the light. He's gone to meetings. He has you know, had conversations with the Grand Master, I think that's what oh. they call him, the Grand Dragon, whatever whatever the term is, um, you know, and he, he does the work of starting those conversations and helping them to understand humanity beyond skin color. And I'm, I'm not that brave, <laughs> but nor, nor is it, I mean, that's not my life mission. My mission is in helping individuals recognize the magic in themselves. But for, to that same extent, you know, I don't believe that anybody wakes up in the morning thinking, you know what, I'm going to be an a-hole today. <laughs> no, nobody does that. Everybody wakes up knowing or feeling like they're going to do the best they can for their families, the best they can for their friends. And if, they, if they've never had a conversation with a person of color, whether it's Asian, Black, Latino, whatever, Latina, um, then they're going to continue living the way that they live. And maybe they come across my song and maybe that song will spur something in them. And that's going to be one way that we can start to overcome these conversations in another way. I understand what you're getting at, Emma. Definitely. And this whole racial war and we become a Christian, doesn't matter what skin color we have. God's not going to say, hey, you black man, you're going to go there, you white go. No, it's all going to be that we're all the same. So I, we have a war already that's going on in Ukraine. We don't need this war with people because of the color of the skin. Like we should stamp out racism. Like we want to stamp out the war in Ukraine as well. We just want to have peace and joy around the world between people that we see each other as we would see ourselves, the same person. Like there's no sense for that. So how does being... Um, a woman of color and the music production, is it different than if you were a different 
skin color? So I, I want to sort of, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to come back to that in, in a minute. I just, I want to, you, you made a point before about like the George Floyd stuff was really horrible. Obviously, we are all aware that George Floyd was one of many. This is, the, these things have been happening for centuries, <laughs> literal centuries. Um, even, you know, with the Emancipation Proclamation Act, or even with um, Martin Luther King and, and giving, you know, black people the right to vote and, you know, the right to be an actual human being as opposed to 0.6 of human being, um, you know, the war on race has been around forever. It has been um, mistitled as the war on drugs quite often. Um, and there have been, you know, like this is just, this has been going on for a long time. I'm grateful to the pandemic for forcing everybody to be at home to witness what happened to George Floyd. Because whilst people of color in this country have known and have been fighting back and have been elevating their voices, rapping about this, singing about this, Anna James, you know, um, for, for, you know, for decades, it took forcing everyone to be at home watching their televisions, watching social media for them to actually recognize, oh crap, this is actually a thing that's happening. We should do something about this, right? Um, so I, yeah, I just, I just want to sort of preface that before I answer your question. My specific experiences about being a woman of color in this country um, doing music have not been the normal experience because again my accent the music that I make um it's been you know I'm I'm not your typical because I wasn't born here and saying that um I have one producer that I work, work with predominantly um and he is he's he's a black guy who lives in Baltimore and he's wonderful he's you know studied with some of the greats when it comes to production um so i like i i very rare like you won't see me really work with anybody else um they'll have to be they'll have to really work hard to convince me to work with somebody else um but in addition to that um when it comes to like you know the corporate entities that i that i perform with or you know i just recently finished um, a song for the American Association for the Advancement of Science, again, about climate change. Um, I've never really had an issue with regards to working in the industry because of my color. Being a woman, and I should say that in this country, back when I was living in New Zealand and working with Static Era, performing with Static Era, um, I had several uh, times when I would perform with them and audience members would say something about my my color, this, you know, the skin color, um, because of the genre that I was in. Hard rock and being a person of color don't necessarily go together uh, according to some people. Obviously, we know that's bollocks, but, <laughs> um, you know, I mean, rock music, metal music, they, they're all rooted in black music you know um but my issues in the states have not been as a result of my skin color those issues predominantly have been from being a woman however again i'm very conscious of the company i keep and the connections that i that i maintain and so if somebody is going to treat me some type of way, I will lovingly send them on their journey <laughs> um, and, and carry on doing what I want to do because life is too short, I think, for me to get wrapped up in trying to convince somebody in the industry of my validity as a human being. Um, that's not, I, I have no interest in that. Um, I know very clearly what I'm here to do. I know very clearly 
what my superpowers are and what my strengths are. Um, and I, I, I don't have the time, patience or energy to try to convince somebody that that my being a woman means that I should act a, such a type of way or that I should perform a type of way or make the music that they want me to make. You know, my music is very personal to me. I We live in a world where the industry is completely different. And therefore my, you know, I know very, very well uh, where the kind of, the kind of career I want to make for myself. And that will not be working with people who are not a heck yes. <laughs> Talking about the pandemic, that must have been really hard for you to even, even though you're at home, was it able to give you more of um, inspiration for writing music and playing and share that yeah. one? Yeah. So during the pandemic, um, it, it was actually just before the pandemic that my partner and I uh, got together. And so, you know, for a lot of make or break it opportunities, <laughs> a lot of couples, uh, you know, either made or, made or broke it um, as a result of the pandemic. The reason why I bring him up is because um, he has been instrumental in helping me to develop more of a spiritual practice. So um, the pandemic literally helped me to get healthier mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and physically. So I found that by staying home, I was able to tap into parts of myself that I was otherwise too busy to really pay attention to. Um, and part of that spiritual practice in particular ha has been focused around meditation, finding um, a relationship with God, source, universe, whatever. Um, and as a result of that relationship, I have been able to tap into more of my songwriting and creativity. And through that creativity and relationship together, I've now been able to tap into more of my reason for being here and my my mission and my purpose. Um, and so that, you know, gave me a whole bunch of beautiful opportunities, such as I wrote a song a day for 30 days straight. Through those, through that exercise, I found that Source was talking to me every day. And, you know, even now I'll look at these lyrics I wrote thinking, I didn't write these. These did not come from me. They, those came from something bigger, right? Um, and then in addition to that, um, you know, then I can was able to, you know, reach audiences that I otherwise hadn't. I was able to create a documentary uh, film uh, with a good friend of mine, Jean Sizemore, who's a filmmaker here in DC or Virginia. Um, I was able to, you know, like there were, there were so many opportunities that, came as a, about as a result of the pandemic. And I think, um, you know, that the thing that keeps coming to mind when I think about the pandemic is the art of kintsugi, which is a Japanese art form um, that literally takes broken ornaments, broken vases, broken whatever, um, and the art form is putting it back together with gold. I heard of that. Yeah. I heard of that. Yeah. yeah. So I feel like the last two years of the pandemic have been like, you know, source saying, let's smash everything <laughs> that you've ever known about how life should be. And let's re-examine and put together something that actually works better. Let's figure out how to put that life back together with gold in a way that's healthier and stronger and more resilient. I like that. Yeah, I've heard of that art form as well. Um, I want to talk to you about your uh, TED Talk that you gave. Um, really ex excellent. You're standing there, you're playing guitar, and then you start talking. Oh, yeah, the TED Talk was was awesome. I um 
you know, I, I went to my first TEDx uh, conference in 2014 back in New Zealand. Had no idea really what TED was, um, but the pro former Prime Minister of New Zealand was going to be speaking and I was excited to go and see her, you know, present. Um, and as a result of that, I was like, this is amazing. Now, part of my Kintsugi pro process has been recognizing that I'm not just here to be a youth empowerment coach. I'm not just here to be a musician. I'm here to use music, use coaching together to help people um, in a way that I think the new information technology world needs, especially Generation Z and Generation Millennial. You know, we have a lot of motivational and keynote speakers around the world who do phenomenal work. However, millennials and Generation Z just don't have the capacity to sit for hours on end listening to people talk. So what I wanna what I wanted to do with my TED talk when this opportunity came and I, I want to shout out Andrea and Anix uh, Singal from the Lauren Center in Rockville, Maryland for putting the, the you know the TEDx event together. Um, but they, you know, what I wanted to do with my TED talk was to combine keynote speaking and motivational speaking with music because again music hits different music activates the part of the brain parts of the brain that speaking alone just doesn't reach so i wanted to you know hammer home my messages without having to um you know run everybody through a, a, a workshop <laughs> you know 18 minutes of of speaking and and singing and and playing music um it was just a, a really unique way for me to share my story, but also help other people in the audience to recognize their power and recognize their magic and recognize their voice and recognize their song. Because we all have a song in us. We just have to be brave enough to, to write it. And, you know, music can be really um, a really powerful tool to help us give, you know, help give us that bravery. I want to talk about your group Static Era. Now, you said you didn't sing with them for seven years. Uh, could you give us an explanation? Um, for instance, we love your music. Uh, we have Dear Me, Behind the Scenes of Dear Me. And then I saw, I like the behind the scenes things, how they do things. <laughs> Thank like, you. Sleeping Dogs is excellent. Uh, uh, Titanium, which is like the acoustic of Saya version, that was good. A lot of the uh, cover versions for people are better than the original. I know. <laughs> Well, thank you. I appreciate it. Can you, so can you explain to me um, how that group started and how, um, what happened after it ended? Sure, sure. So my, um, I grew up in a, a small town uh, between Raglan and Hamilton in, in New Zealand. Um, and when I turned 21, I decided to move to the big smoke of Auckland, New Zealand, um, to make a go of doing music full time. And you know, create a create a career for myself, um, and that was a really beautiful experience. Um, I I sort of started off doing, um, you know, I, I got a part time job at as a travel agent, and then was doing music uh, on the side. Um, and one day, I you know, music on the side, so that I could start building my connections and contacts uh, before going full time. But my um, one, one night I was playing at an open mic when a friend of mine, Chris Young, walked in. And Chris had been in a hard rock band a few years prior um, that I loved um, as a teenager. And, you know, I, 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 I said that, you know, I was looking, I told him I was looking for maybe looking at, into starting a band. And did he know anybody? that would be interested in playing with me not for a million years dreaming that he would be interested because <laughs> to me i was like i was small fish and he was like chris young you know this amazing musician that i've been following for years um so that was really cool and then together we sort of sought out a couple of other music a drummer and a bassist 
um, to complete the outfit. And we were together for five and a half years. We released um, two EPs and an album and eight singles. And it was a lot of work, you know. We all were self-produced. We did our videos ourselves. We recorded, we gigged, we toured. Um, but, you know, in New Zealand, we have four sheep to every person and three cows to every person. We don't have many people. Um, and so it was very difficult to make a full-time income from doing music. In fact, as a band, we didn't make any income. We spent a lot of money and didn't make anything back, really. Um, I was doing covers gigs as a solo artist uh, full-time for about a year. And it was just, it was it was a hustle. Um, but it was wonderful at the same time. And the thing that I take from, you know, those, those years was, you know, the lessons I learned that about being proactive, about, you know, having the knowledge on production and on um, songwriting and on just the entire music business. Um, when it comes to, when it came to moving to America and then, you know, outsourcing production to somebody else and outsourcing video production to somebody else, you know, so that I, I know what goes on behind the scenes and I can put my input in when I need to. So that was really powerful. However, um, the reason, I mean, 2014 happened that year, I was an ambassador for Tough Mudder, uh, the 18K obstacle course um, that sweeps the world. Um, I was also, uh, you know, I got some really high media coverage as a, um, you know, ambassador of Tough Mudder. I was an X Factor uh, where I came sixth and I got booted off because I refused to play the role of an angry black woman on camera. Um, and then I was also, you know, we, the band hit the top 20. Um, but I kind of felt like I'd hit, and I also won a New Zealander of the New Zealander of the Year Local Heroes Award that year. So, but I, I kind of felt like I hit the ceiling as much as I could, and I wanted to grow more and I wanted to learn more about the country that my mother grew up in. So I decided to move here in 2015, and um, that's when we kind of split ways. We released Sleeping Dogs just before I left New Zealand, and then Dear Me came out after I'd left and arrived into the States. And um, I think those were, you know, as much as I miss the band terribly, I think it served its purpose in all of our careers. You know, um, we all have moved on with our careers and we're all doing you know, different things. And uh, Victor Pesh, who's the bassist, he's doing a lot of videography stuff still. And um, Dave Rhodes, who is the drummer as well as the recording engineer, has a fantastic home studio that he runs in um, a small town on the West Coast. Oh, the, so yeah, the, the East Coast, I think, of New Zealand. Chris Young is in a heavy metal band now and doing a whole bunch of really cool things. And I just, I'm really, I'm really grateful for the time and the music that we made but i'm just a, i'm a different person these days i'm so saddened that your group broke up this was a group that could have just continued i mean yeah. fire away was my favorite song oh thank you that's sort yes. of a lyric taken from titanium is that a, no, was that, it, no it wasn't it wasn't it was uh it was chris coming to practice one day going we need to write a fight song of like bring it on try me and um I, I i want to pick on him a little bit because he has been and i actually i mentioned him in my book reconnect with a teenager um he was one of the he, i think he was the first person actually to teach me about the alchemy of songwriting you know it's really easy as songwriters to wallow in self-pity and wallow in misery. He helped me to recognize the power of words when it comes to rewriting our life song. So Fire Away was the first time 
that he looked at me and was like, okay, Emma, you have been through hell. Let's write a song to those experiences about how to grow from those experiences and how to come out the other side better, stronger, and better than before, you know? And um, I will I will be forever grateful for his mentorship in terms of helping me become a better songwriter and, and writing songs about, you know, being a better, stronger, more resilient human being. So in your opinion, what would be the most important personality trait or strength someone would need to be a singer songwriter and become successful at it? It's a toss up for me between grit and flexibility. Not, fl not flexibility. Um, well, you know, flexibility, like the ability to kind of uh, adjust when you need to. Because um, quite often we, things will show up that you just like weren't prepared for. And you, so you need to be like cooking your feet. Wow, that's amazing. Well, what would you think is the meaning of life for you? Oh, that's a good question. The meaning of life. I think the biggest, uh, the meaning of life for me is to, to love and be loved. And to grow. And when I say love, I'm not talking about romantic love. I'm talking about service. I'm talking about contribute, contributing to the world, you know, love in, in, in all of its complexities. If you die tonight, do you feel that you have accomplished everything you wanted to do? Do you feel that there's more to do? There's definitely more to do, which is why I know that I'm not going to die tonight. I have one more big question for you here. Um, what's the biggest takeaway you hope the listeners would learn? I would hope that your listeners would walk away from this, listening to this podcast, recognizing their inner strength, their, and the magic that's in them that they don't even realize they have yet. Thank you very much, Emma, for joining us here on stage, and I really appreciate the conversation. Okay, everyone, we're going to end the stream, and um, we're going to link all the music from Static Era and from Emma G down in the description, especially her TED Talk. Check it out. It's wonderful. And check out the song I Am, and check out the song Fire Away from Static Era. Beautiful, beautiful music. And so, okay, thank you, Emma. Catch you later. Bye. <laughs>